Okay. I think it's working now. Oh, incredible. So sorry about that. Um, so, no problem. Repeat, uh, the question I had earlier. Uh, so someone asked what like, advice you have for patients that consider spinal cord stimulation or neuromodulation. Advice is not to start with spinal cord stimulation as a therapy. They should start with drugs. They should start with physiotherapy. They should start with all other options. And if all these options are not working out, only then try with spinal cord stimulation. That does not mean that the patient has to wait 20 years. Because after 20 years, the chances of a successful outcome are limited. There are publications that show that the best results are within the first five years after the onset of pain. After that, there are some patients that can benefit from it, but not the majority of them. What is important for all of us to understand, patients and for the physicians, is that spinal cord stimulation is not the only therapy. The majority of patients need a combination of spinal cord stimulation, drugs, physiotherapy, and psychological therapy. It's a multimodal treatment. We should not expect any miracles. I cannot tell you that if a patient gets into the spinal cord stimulator, then the pain is going to be zero and the patient does not need anything more. This is not a reality. It would be nice, but it wouldn't be true. So they should be prepared to have a combination of therapies. Only in such a way we can have good results for the many, many next uh, years. Thank you. So I have a question that's not quite related to functional neurosurgery, but in regards to pursuing a career in Germany. So someone's asking any advice on pursuing a neurosurgery residency in Germany. I don't think I can answer this question because I came uh, to Germany as a consultant. I didn't do the residency here in Germany. But what I can tell you is that if you want to do the residency in Germany, you'll have to come to Germany. You have to learn the language. This is really important because the language is not an easy one. So I'm here almost eight years and my German is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, but I had to learn German seven years old. Now I'm 45. I assume most uh, of our uh, colleagues that are listening now are younger than 37 years old. So it's going to be a little bit easier for them to learn uh, German, but uh, this is uh, a must. And uh, you cannot learn the language if you're staying in your own. You'll have to come here and spend some time here. And an observership could be a good idea for a certain period of time so that we can hear German. In real life, you can speak German in uh, real life. There are many positions here in Germany. This should not be a problem to find a position here. Uh, but then it depends what do you want. If you want a position in an academic hospital, a university hospital, this would be more difficult. If you want a position in a smaller hospital, in a smaller city, that wouldn't be a problem. For me, the most important obstacle is the language. If you already know German or if you are willing to learn German, then there are many chances here. And don't forget, the German colleagues are leaving Germany. So <laughs> that means there are many positions open for all foreigners that are willing to leave their countries for some years or for, their next, for the rest of their lives and come here and uh, work. And one more important thing, if you come here to do an observership, please walk around in the cities and see how the people is talking, speaking, acting. Have a look at the weather. How is the weather? I'm coming from we used to have sunshine. Here in Germany, it's not that sunny so frequently. If you really like food, as I do, uh, it could be difficult for you because the ingredients here in Germany are a little bit different. Most of them are imported factors that you should take, take into consideration. If you just want to come to Germany, spend six years, do the residency, and then go away, it's not a problem. If you want to spend the rest of your life in this country, then you should be really careful and think about all other parameters as well. Here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, I guess myself, one of the people who left Germany for the UK. Yeah. Um, all right, so I have another question. 
Um, are there any similar side effects of neuromodulation? And um, which are the most common ones? Once again, please, I didn't hear you correctly. There are some interruptions. Oh, so sorry. Um, so are there any severe side effects of neuromodulation? And um, if yes, which are the most common side effects? Side effects. We are talking about current. If we stimulate, we apply current. If uh, the amplitude is too high, then the patients are having more pain than their own. If we are using less current than necessary, then we cannot influence the pain. The pain uh, stays uh, stable. This is all the problems that are related to the current, to the stimulation. But spinal cord stimulation is a surgery, is an operation. That means we can have the same problems that we can see in all other operations. Bleeding, for example, hemat or infection, this could be a problem, or injuring a spinal root. We are working in the vicinity of spinal roots. If somebody does not have the experience, could damage a spinal root with detrimental effects for the patient in the future. And for the leads, the leads are fixated with uh, sutures. That means, with 20 years ago, it was much worse. Now the quality of the products is much better. The leads can move granally or caudally. Then we should operate the patients once again and uh, fixate the leads. But let's say all these complications together are about the odds are 5% in five years in experienced uh, setters. If somebody is offering this surgery once or twice per year, of course, the complications would be higher. Mm -hmm. If somebody is doing that every day, so in my hospital, for example, we do more than 100 such operations per year. We have accumulated experience, not only me, the whole team, we are a team, it's not only me, it's a team of uh, four physicians that is doing that. So we have complications, but they are really limited. But on the other hand, if you go to a dentist, you can have also a complication. But one must also Not think about good. that we are, just theoretically, if you are a chronic pain patient and you are really having pain and you are not uh, acting like having a pain because you, have, you want to gain uh, financial uh, things, then uh, the risk is really minimal and the quality of life influences in the positive uh, way. So we do talk with the patients before the surgery. We do explain them what types of problems could come during or after this surgery. But if the patients are really having pain, all of them are saying, we are doing it. And this for me is a criterion to see if the people are really having uh, pain. It's a selection. Right, thank you so much. Uh, another question is, what would you say neuromodulation or spinal cord stimulation is more effective in spinal cord injury or traumatic brain injury? Spinal cord stimulation is a therapy uh, against chronic uh, pain. This is the indication of the pain, not the functional improvement. In cases of spinal cord injury, the results are not that good as compared to patients with back or leg pain uh, after uh, back operation, back surgery. So in spinal cord injury patients, we should be very, very careful. We have to speak with the patients and see which is the goal. If the goal of the patient is to walk again, then we should not do it at this point. After some years, it could be different. Now, I wouldn't do it. If the patient with spinal cord injury, and there are many of them, uh, have... Uh, chronic pain, then spinal cord stimulation could relieve this pain. And these patients are uh, good candidates for this therapy. For patients with traumatic brain injury, there is no indication cord uh, stimulation. Uh, we cannot offer this operation. Thank you so much. Um, another question is, what are the most uh, seeing that you've seen quite a few different countries and hospitals. Um, but to ask something, patients with uh, traumatic brain injuries, many of them 
heeft spastisti. Not chronic pain, but spastisti. And uh, the spastisti is really severe and they cannot work. They cannot act in their everyday life because of spasticity. Of course, we are trying with drugs, baclofen tablets, for example, or Botox, something like that, Botox injections. But if the spasticity is generalized, then the only reasonable therapy is an intratecal baclofen therapy. You have to implant the catheter intra intratecally, and you have to apply, to apply baclofen uh, there. This is another neuromodulation option. And if you are interested, please do visit the official website of the International Neuromodulation Society, it's neuromodulation.com. There we can find many definitions about all uh, diseases, about all therapies. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question regarding the training. It seems that you've trained in quite a few countries and different hospitals. Um, which one was your favorite? The training. The training is, a, <laughs> it depends what do you mean when you're saying training. Is it training in general neurosurgery or is it training in functional neurosurgery? These are two different things. I think the majority of our colleagues that are with us today are interested in uh, the general neurosurgery. So for something like that, I can only tell you that Germany has a huge tradi tradition in general neurosurgery. I cannot speak about any other countries. Some years ago, the tradition was really good in the United Kingdom as well for neurosurgery. I don't know if still this applies. I cannot tell that. But in Germany, the, ger the level of general neurosurgery is really good. For functional neurosurgery now, there are very limited centers that offering something like that. And in Germany, the positions for foreigners are, are li really limited. It's extremely difficult to find a position in such uh, places to do a residency. It's easy to come as observers, but an observership will not learn you to operate. You are going to see. You are not going to do anything. So you will have to find a center, I believe not in Germany, who would allow you to actively participate uh, in the surgeries. And uh, in the European Union, this would not be that easy. Thank you so much. Um, when continuing with that question, maybe as a closing question as well, do you have any advice for junior doctors and medical students that are interested in neurosurgery? To think twice. Because so um, there are... Any advice for current juniors? Sorry. My um, advice would be to think questions. again. You have... No. <laughs> German surgery is not uh, easy, especially if you want to combine it with a uh, family life. Okay, and this is one of the advantages of functional neurosurgery, because by doing only functional neurosurgery, you have uh, the luxury to have a pretty normal personal life. If you are a general neurosurgeon and you have to go to work on Saturdays on Sundays, to operate on patients with traumatic brain injury, for example, then the quality of life is not uh, optimal. I know because I did that some years ago. It's really interesting. It's really exciting to do these things. But uh, you'll have to think what will happen after 20 years from now when you are married with children. It's not uh, that easy. You'll have to be really committed in order to do it. It is doable if you want to, if you, it is doable, but you'll have to know, you'll have to sacrifice something. And this something could be a part of your professional life or it could be a part of your private life. If you are ready for it, go for it. My advice for you could be to try to get the education of the general neurosurgeon, but then try to get a specialization. For example, spine surgery only, peripheral nerves, for example, or functional neurosurgery. Because it's nice. I always uh, watch Grey's Anatomy. I always watch the neurosurgeon there. It looks good. It feels good. But uh, in everyday life, it's a completely, it's really difficult to combine the professional and the private life.
as a general neurosurgeon. No, thank you so much for this very honest answer. I have one final, final question, and we want to you, take you on, like, let you get on with you someday. Um, will neuromodulation devices ever be lit, like wireless? Wireless? Yeah. We have already wireless options. The problem is, and this is the, the problem is that the devices that we do have now, for spinal cord simulation at least, are not mature. So the companies will have to invest some millions of dollars or euros to make the products uh, better. The technology is completely different if we use it for peripheral nerve simulation, for nerves under the skin. In such cases, this wireless technology could work at the present point now. But if we're talking about placing a lead near the spinal cord, so spinal cord stimulation, then in my opinion, the therapy is not uh, so advanced. We'll have to wait some years. But this is the future, this is the tendency, and should be so because it's not nice to have a big neurostimulator in your buttock area. I can imagine. Well, thank you so, so much for your time today, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, hope you enjoyed that discussion <laughs> and all the questions. Thanks for the invitation. And all of you guys who are new to the Brain Book or haven't heard of us before, we're a YouTube-based charity working on improved patient education. Uh, we've got a lot of educational projects at the minute for both medical students and patients. Um, we will be hosting another case discussion in two weeks' time, and we do have a um, neurosurgery essentials workshop next weekend. It's completely free of charge. Um, I'll post another link to that, and please do come and join us. Otherwise, thank you so, so much again for your time today. I really enjoyed the discussion, and I hope you have an amazing rest of your Sunday. Bye. Bye. Have a nice evening. Goodbye. Bye.